Glenn Morris from the Smart Energy Lab. And today I've got Justin Cullen from Hire. G'day, Justin. G'day, Claire. <laughs> so Justin and I have been kind of like standing back watching our plumbers install a hot water heat pump system. Uh, it was pretty cool. Yeah, it was a great experience today. Yeah, really enjoyed it. I mean, they started at, uh, I think, about 8 o'clock and finished about half an hour ago, so 11.30. Yep. That's pretty pretty sweet install. Really nice, clean install and really straightforward. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk a bit about heat pumps. Now, um, I've, I'm familiar with some of the concepts, but I want to sort of elucidate those a little bit with you. But before we start on that, let's just talk a bit, a bit about Hire, um, the company. So initially... I, th- I was thinking it was Fisher and Paykel, but you just pointed out to me that Fisher and Paykel is a subsidiary of a parent company called Hire. That's right. Yeah. So back in 2012, Hire as a company bought out Fisher and Paykel, bought them under the umbrella, as they have with many other global well-known brand brands. I'm sure you're aware of GE Appliances, Sanyo, Candy, uh, all companies that fall under that Hire banner. Hoover. Hoover. Exactly. Yes. Another one. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. So yeah, they're really a, a global company and they're, they're in the Home appliances, broad spectrum. So a whole bunch of companies that deal with appliances you find in your home. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, but many other name brands. The high brand itself has come a long way in Australia in the last couple of years. Very strong with uh, household appliances, fridges, dishwashers, washing machines, you name it. And a lot of that has come from the expertise they've picked up from companies like Fisher & Parkle being in that same umbrella. Yeah, right. Okay, so coming to um, the heat pump technology, uh, why would you choose a heat pump over, say, a conventional resistive hot element, hot water element? So at at the end of the day, you get the same experience with the hot water in your home, uh, but it's the way we're heating the water is the big difference. So traditionally, electric resistive element, hot water units, uh, one kilowatt in is one kilowatt out. You don't really get a benefit for those. So one kilowatt out of... Heated water. Heated potential. water, gotcha. Yep. So one kilowatt consumed, you get one kilowatt of heated water. Uh, whereas with heat pump hot water, they work on what they call a COP or a coefficient of performance. So with our unit in particular, one kilowatt in is actually a four and a half kilowatt return. So now, a lot that, that seems efficient. a bit like magic to me. <laughs> it is get, a little now, bit. Where does that extra three and a half kilowatts come from? So it, beca- it comes from a re- refrigerant cycle in the unit. So we actually use refrigerant in the system to transfer heat into the tank and into the water. Well, what's the source of that heat? Uh, so it's a compressor in the unit, uh, super, uh, putting the refrigerant under a, a really high pressure, which generates a lot of heat, which we then pump, pump through a, a microchannel condenser on the unit to transfer that heat into the water. Right. Now, where is the thermal input to the whole system? What, what's the source of that? So that's from the, from the air around the unit. So air and temperature around the unit, we're pulling air in, passing it over our, our unit on the, on the top side uh, and drawing that heat out of the ambient air. Now, I'm sorry for asking this as a bit of a Dorothy Dixer because I do know the answer to that. But it, it is kind of surprising, really, that a, a heat pump is a solar water heater but doesn't need to be in the sun. That's right. Yeah, in effect, uh, same sort of idea but doesn't have to have that direct sunlight. And that's probably why it receives the same rebates or similar rebates as solar panels and solar um, um, hot water systems because yep. it is a solar water heater. That's right. Yeah, yep. right. Oh, that's pretty cool. Now, um, when we're installing it, um, the plumber – spent a bit of time looking at some of the components uh, or or connecting some of the components. And I thought it was going to be pretty simple, cold water and hot water out, but there's more to it than that. Yeah, there is. Yeah, there's quite a few valves involved. Uh, So cold cold water expansion valves, pressure and temperature relief valves, tempering valves that all go into making the unit work properly. Now, one of them, which even the plumber said it was the first time he installed one, was a pressure release valve on the cold inlet. Now, I'm I'm familiar with um, so-called PTR, pressure, temperature, relief valve, in case you overheat your tank, yep. it can dribble out some hot water. But why would you have one on the cold side? So having one on the cold side allows you to lose cold water. So rather than losing heated water, which you've invested time and money in out of the PTR valve, we're actually able to lose water on the cold or inlet side. So it just makes the unit more efficient uh, and also saves you a little, little bit more money on your bills. Right. Okay. I believe that's um, in some states that's actually mandatory. That's right. Yeah. So sadly here in Victoria, it's not. So it's very uncommon. And that's why earlier today, Reese had, had not really come across it much before. We've got it in our manual and I personally recommend it to anyone putting in a heat pump or wood in it to put a cold water expansion valve in. Big shout out to Reese, uh, Reese Williams Plumbing, because he read the manual before he came here. He did. I mean, he's way ahead of a lot of people I work with, including Rare. myself. Yeah. <laughs> I, mate, I can tell you the last time I read a manual. So he's done really well today. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Reese. Now, um, just in terms of, there's one more valve, a tempering valve. What does that do? So tempering valve just ensures that the water going into the home isn't of a temperature that can scald someone. 
So as uh, plumbing standards regulate, that the, the, if we're feeding into a, what they call a sanitary fixture, so a shower or a hand basin, it needs to be 50 degrees or below so no one gets scalded. So in this instance, we've just got a tempering valve on the feed into the entire dwelling. And that's mandatory in Victoria? It is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. right. Now, there was um, – when my electrician was fitting off the plug, because it is a plug-in device, so you can hardwire it if you wish. That's right, yeah. Yep. Um, you have some recommendations. If you're plugging into a, a socket outlet, you recommended something about that socket outlet. So that outlet uh, – it's a 10-amp outlet is what we recommend. 15-amp is also applicable, um, but it has to be a dedicated circuit, and that's just to allow enough power available for the unit so you're not going to trip any breakers or anything like that. So it's partly a reliability issue. Uh, you might have turned on the kettle – it tripped a breaker, you didn't notice it, and you've got a cold shower. Yep, and it's regulated by uh, electrical standards as well. So AS3000 stipulates that for a unit of this type, it needs to be a dedicated circuit. Right. Okay. Um, the other thing coming out of the tank was a cable which uh, my electrician wondered what it was for. Now, tell me about that one. Yeah, we get a, a lot of questions on it. So on our unit, we actually have what we call a communications cable or comms cable, which is something that lets us either wire into a smart meter for off-peak power or dreads uh, control of the unit. Could you explain uh, what dread is? Dreads is demand response. So if there's uh, a large draw on the power grid, it enables bodies, generally government bodies, to dial back power and stop certain units within homes running. So typically air con, sometimes hot water, they'll dial those back to avoid blackouts and brownouts. All right. So no one would really notice that their hot water system was off for two minutes. No. Uh, but it could avoid a blackout. That's right. Oh, yep. All right. Yep. So it's not very common. There are pockets of the country where it is. South Australia is probably the biggest adopter of it at the moment, yep. uh, but it is becoming more common. And you mentioned uh, it can also be connected to an inverter. That's right. What would you do that for? So we can wire to the dry contact on an inverter, which just allows the unit to use excess PV power to run an extra heating cycle. So that's what we would refer to as a boost cycle. So the standard temperature we hold uh, water in the tank is at 60 degrees. To run that extra heating cycle, heat it to 65. So it gives you a, a larger mixing capacity because you're going to temper that down in the home for use. Uh, but the maths in my head's thinking five degrees increase on a 250 litre tank or 248, isn't it? Um, how many kilowatt hours is that? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. <laughs> but basically it's soaking up some of your surplus solar. That's right, rather than putting it back into the right, grid. Right, yeah. so that's really good. So it's kind of like smart solar as part of that design. Yeah, and it's a really smart way of doing it. Traditionally with heat pump up water, we would just set a timer yeah. and cross your fingers that you've got enough generation there to run the unit for when you want it to run. So generate from 10 till 4. This is a really smart way of doing it because the unit will know 100% there's enough power available and I'm not going to pull any any power from the grid to run the extra heating cycle it's going to do. Speaking of which, uh, I mean, how much uh, energy does it use to heat the tank? So the compressor is 430 watts, mm -hmm. so relatively small, um, but the way it's designed and the refrigerant gas that we use, very efficient, so the, the, the units recover in the neighbourhood of about 45 litres per hour. So 45 litres per hour. And it, it's, it draws about 450 watts when it's doing the, the heating cycle. That's right. Right. Yeah. So it's quite a small energy use. I, I did see on the, the star rating, I think it was, or the rating for it is about a kilowatt hour a day. Yeah, generally. For typical home use. Yep. So anecdotal evidence from customers we, we've, we've spoken to after install, it's anywhere between uh, one kilowatt and 1.3 kilowatts per day. Right. Well, that's that's tiny. <laughs> yeah, really small, especially when you compare it to an ele a traditional electric storage, which is 3.6 kilowatts an hour, which you, you're talking multiple hours to reheat a tank, you yeah, better part of 10 kilowatts a day to recover. That's certainly my experience. Around about 10 is pretty typical. Yep. Yeah, wow, that's that's cool. I, I th we're actually um, off-grid here, and one of the, the, the considerations with off-grid is maximum demand yep. now, on your inverter system. Now, having a water heater that's maximum demand is – Less than 10 amps, uh, more likely 5 amps, Yeah, uh, is great. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a, it's a great benefit of our system. Yep. Yeah, cool. And, and it has the ability to run a, what we call a boost mode, so to use the heat pump and the backup element together, and that's where we get closer to that 10 amp draw. But the general use of the unit will just be the heat pump and it will be that 430 watts. So what is the boost element or the boost cycle for? So the boost cycle is just for quicker recovery but also for a higher temperature. So you can set – the boost function to heat the tank right up to 75 degrees. So you've got a much bigger mixing capacity. Oh. Also reheats a lot quicker. So if you've got extra people staying over at your home, you need more showers, you've got to fill baths, whatever the instance is where you need more hot water, it'll run just one heating cycle using that boost and then fall back to whatever your default was before that. Okay. So do you have to like run out and press a button? 
Uh, you can, absolutely you can. You can run out and hit boost on the unit. Yep. Uh, we also have an app called Smart HQ, which is the same app that we use for our HVAC units, but also our Fisher and Parkle and higher appliances. So you pair it with the app and you can do it all from your couch if you want to. <laughs> I like the sound of that. <laughs> do it from the couch. That's right. I suppose you could even do it from before you get home. So yeah. you, you know that you've got a big you know big party and lots of people turning up and it's going to be a big hot water demand. That's right. And it's even home. got a, a vacation mode in it as well. So for that specific reason, you're in the airport in Sydney, you're flying back down to Melbourne, you know you're going to be home in a couple of hours, all the family wants to have a shower when you get back, turn it out of vacation mode, put it back into auto or eco, whatever mode you're normally in. So when you get home, you know you've got enough hot water for showers. So what does vacation mode do? Vacation mode just – stops the unit from doing its daily reheat and will only operate a Legionella sterilization cycle once per week. Just as per standards dictate, we'll run that Legionella cycle just to kill any bacteria in the tank. So you can set the amount of days you're going to be away so it'll do it automatically or you can change it on the app yourself. That's much safer than just turning off your hot water cylinder while you're That's away right. for a month on holiday and coming back to a Legionella full tank. That's right, yep. <laughs> and cold showers. And cold showers. <laughs> Um, just, just in case people are freaking out, we'll be saying Legionella. Is, is that um, a very common occurrence to have Legionella in a hot water tank? Not very common. As long as the unit's functioning correctly, it, it, it really won't happen. But uh, it's something we need to be aware of because of how deadly Legionella can be. And you said that Legionella only lives in a very narrow temperature range. Yeah, I believe it to be somewhere between 15 and 20 degrees. So wow. it's a very narrow range where it'll actually grow, but it's something that, you know, stored hot water, any stagnant water in particular, something you need to be aware of. Yeah, cool. Now, when we were talking about different um, uh, ways of using uh, refrigerants, you mentioned there's some good ones and some bad ones out there. Yep. Um, so what do you use? So we use R290 in our units, which is what they class as a natural refrigerant. It's more or less propane is what we use. So whilst not perfect, it is much more environmentally friendly, having a GWP or a global warming potential of only three. Uh, the only refrigerant that's better than that on the market currently is CO2, which is a GWP of one or almost zero. Uh, and the most common one for heat pump technology on the market at the moment is R134A, which is a GWP of 1,430. Oh, my gosh. I, I, <laughs> so I thought really you were going to go cap. 3 to 10, but <laughs> to 1,400. Okay, yeah. so um, what's that last one? R134A. Oh, wow. Okay, we don't want that. No. You're right. And that's one of the reasons why you actually need to get someone to decommission your system. You can't just throw it in hard garbage. That's right, yeah. They don't reclaim that refrigerant and recycle it. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, cool. Wow. Um, look, I'm just thinking, I think we've covered just about everything I wanted to talk about. Did I miss out on anything? Um, I guess the, the just the big call-outs between Hire as a manufacturer and many others on the market is we are the developer and manufacturer of this product. So we've developed it in-house as Fisher & Paykel and worked with Hire, our company, to build this product and bring it to fruition for us. Uh, we're selling it in the Australian and New Zealand market as well. So what was important for us, New Zealand doesn't have the same sort of government support that we have here for our product. So we had to make sure that the unit was compelling enough to be sold with or without rebates and that return on investment that you would spend on the product, you could make that back within the warranty period, which which we can with our product, with where we're priced it in the market, but also our warranty terms, which are, which are pretty significant, uh, seven years on the tank and five years parts and labour. So pretty comprehensive warranty with our product as well. Um, but also being the manufacturer means we're much more agile. So if things that we need to make improvements or changes with our product, which we've already done since release late last year, we can do that ourselves relatively easily and it's just us you know, coming up with what the changes need to be and, and working with our factory to make it happen. There's a lot of other product on the market that's made by third-party manufacturers. Nothing wrong with that. They're still of a very high quality but not as agile or as flexible as we are as a business. I should mention also that we actually are replacing an instantaneous gas water heater, which is in terms of uh, <laughs> global <laughs> emissions is a, a really big improvement That's right. um, because we were running it off bottle gas, so very expensive, high emissions. Now we've got an energy-efficient system using renewable energy, 100% renewable because we run off the sun here. Um, just a, 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 probably a, a tip to, to viewers is if you, if you do have a resistive hot water element tank and it's about 10 years old, don't wait for it to go bang and spill its guts yep. and then you freak out and call a plumber saying, I need a hot water tank today. You want to plan these things, don't you? That's right. It's a really considered decision. The amount of money you're investing in a product like this, you yep. really want to do your research. Um, and 10 to 12 years is about the lifespan that we see for a storage hot water unit. So that's right in the neighbourhood to be replaced. Do your research now, get ahead, find a product you like, whether it's mine or, or another product on the market, make a, cons a really considered decision because it is an investment and make sure you're getting the right product that's fit for purpose. And in Australia, there are both federal and state incentive programs to, you know, 
make it very affordable. So right. it's all part of the, the plan to meet our target by 2035. Exactly right. Yeah. Cool. Well, Justin, uh, thanks for coming along. Thank you for having me. It's been great. Thank you.